All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are live with the UC Master Gardener program. Thank you so much. This is a free presentation today um, from the UC Master Gardener program statewide office to all of our great followers out there on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you for joining us. This is free. Share widely. If you joined live, great. If you're watching the recording, thank you so, so much. We are so happy to have you here today with us with our partner, Plant Right. We have Alex today. Hi, Alex. Thanks for joining us. We are live from the beautiful state of California. If you're joining us from somewhere else, welcome. We are going to be talking about invasive plants in California. Um, I do know that from a statewide perspective, we have done, um, we've talked about invasive plants in California before and we get people from Texas that say, but it's not invasive here. So yeah, not all plants are invasive in all areas. We are specifically California based. We are the UC Master Gardener Program and Plant Right is a great organization in the state that um, Alex will be talking to us about today. And uh, I want you guys to look and you can type in the chat to let us know where you're joining us from and if you've ever participated in the Plant Right survey. So Anyone can answer the question of where you're from. And if you participate in the Plant Rights Survey, you're most likely a UC Master Gardener volunteer. And thank you for joining us today. And don't forget, this counts as continuing education. So be sure to record it in the volunteer management system to get credit. Oh, guess what, Alex? We have someone from LA County Master Gardeners in North Hollywood. Very fancy. Okay. Um, I know. Uh, um, everyone here, I am a UC Master Gardener from the Sutter Yuba area, and I'm also the statewide training coordinator, Lauren Snowden. Alex, would you like to tell us where you're from by chance? Sure. Um, I am based in Sacramento, California, um, and that's where I'm broadcasting from today. So. <laughs> Alex, we're about 40 miles apart, so that's nice. I'm broadcasting from my home office as well. And we have people answering in the comments section. They haven't participated in the survey. We have someone from Lancaster, California and LA County. Welcome everyone. We're up to about 57 participants um, on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you guys for joining us. Drop some hearts if you don't wanna put anything in the comments. As on Facebook, we love to see little hearts pop up. It makes me smile and feel a little warm and giddy inside. Side. So working um, from home, uh, you can kind of see my dog in the background. Well, this shoulder, uh, he's enjoying the sunshine. So nice and warm up here, a little windy. So loving California winter. All right, we got Alameda County Master Gardener. Welcome, welcome. So if you've ever participated in the Plant Rights Survey as a UC Master Gardener volunteer, go ahead and uh, write it in there. They've been doing this since 2016. Is that what it is? Um, so Alex will talk a little bit more about that. All right, we're about four minutes in and we have 60 people. Okay. I'm not going to chat anymore. Alex, we are so glad to have you here. I'm going to hand it over to our partner, Plant Right. Alex, take it away. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here today to present to you about Plant Right, um, tell you about what we do, who we are, um, and potentially how you could get involved. So um, thanks for having me, everyone. And uh, let's go ahead and jump into what is plant right here. So these are the topics I'm going to cover. Um, and let's go ahead into the first one. It sounds like um, I'm reading some of the comments and some of you have participated before. A um, couple of you signed up and it was canceled last year. Um, I apologize for that. Obviously, everyone had to make some changes to um, their plans last year and kind of adapt. Um, but thank you so much for those of you who have um, participated and those of you who had intended to. Um, hopefully, we'll get to do it this year. Um, but more about that later. So first of all, for those of you who aren't familiar with Plant Right, our program is devoted to promoting the use of non-invasive plants for gardening and landscaping in California. And we do that um, by several ways. So keeping track of invasive plants in the retail nursery market, partnering with retail nurseries that share our values, 
and educating the nursery industry and the public about invasive plants and their safer non-invasive alternatives. So Plant Right is housed at Plant California Alliance in Sacramento. And what Plant California Alliance is, is an association of nursery industry professionals. Um, they do a lot of really great things like funding research for the industry, providing scholarships for students who are interested in horticulture, and just advocating for the industry overall. Um, and they have just been a really long time committed partner to Plant Right, and they've been a great fit to be the host for this program. Um, so at Plant Right, we always like to talk about how our approach is collaborative, voluntary, and science-based. Um, so you may or may not be familiar with all of these logos here on the screen, but this is just a sample of some of our partners and advisors um, that we work with um, throughout these different industries. So throughout the nursery industry, throughout um, the nonprofit sector, we have partners in government and in science and academia. And what this does by including all of these different um, industries and sectors in our project, it really makes sure our approach is well-rounded and well-informed. And we're lucky enough to have representatives from all of these different sectors on our steering committee and on our plant list committee to make sure that our decisions and our overall program uh, direction is really grounded in good information and that it's taking stock of all the different diverse stakeholders that have to do with um, plants and invasive plants and all these different things. So we are really lucky to have um, stakeholders from all those different groups. So that is my real quick and dirty introduction to Plant Right. Um, obviously, you'll learn more as we go along, but um, I don't know if there were any um, specific questions about Plant Right, but you know what? I don't see anything in the chat, but we did drop a link to plantright.org so that people can go visit you later. What I would love to say, Alex, is that those words that you posted that said collaborative and science-based and volunteer, it's a great fit with the UC a &R family, University of California Ag and Natural Resources family and the University um, Cooperative Extension Program. Like We're very happy to be part of this as a UC Master Gardener program. It's a, like, it just, it, it fits like like when you say those words I'm like that's us that's us so thank you very much for uh being here today with us and talking about um stuff that you know we all we really support and believe in thank you awesome yeah thank you and um if you do uh, go visit plantright.org um even if you want to pull it up during the presentation i will be referencing the website um, quite a lot. So you can either check it out during the presentation or afterwards for more information. Um, but before I go any further, um, we all need to get on the same page about what are invasive plants. Um, what am I talking about in this context? So here's kind of the general definition. Invasive plants are first non-native or foreign to an area. In this case, we're talking about California and specific regions of California. Invasive plants can spread and reproduce on their own um, with no input or help from humans, although we do help to spread them quite a bit, as you'll learn throughout the presentation. Um, and they cause harm either to the environment, um, they cause economic harm, and or harm to human health and safety. So that is kind of the baseline definition for an invasive plant. And um, I may just be preaching to the choir here. So I want to know what are some of the invasive plants that you know of that you either love or hate? Um, can we have some of those dropped in the chat if you if anyone wants to type some invasive plants in that they... Alex, thank you so much for bringing... 
for bringing this up. Uh, people, like uh, Alex said, drop in the chat if there's an invasive plant that you know of that you see or that you know you know specifically. Alex, look at the screen real quick. Uh, we use this as an advertising tool, this photo. And what was great is that we were like, immediately people were in the comments going, uh, those plants are invasive. And I'm like, these are my people. They know <laughs> what's in this photo and they know that it's invasive. So it was great because there are people in the comments totally mad we're using the photo. And I'm like, this is perfect. We're with plant right. We're talking about this plant. It looks, it's a great photo, right? These plants look amazing. But guess what? It's invasive and it still is there. Um, looking amazing, but invasive. Yeah. Uh, we have some, <laughs> some uh, comments in. We have Mexican feather grass from Melissa Womack. Um, we have castor bean, Nandina and broom, French mm -hmm. broom, oh, pampas grass. Thank you. Uh, morning glory pampas grass, um, forking oxalis. <laughs> uh, I love Mexican feather grass, but I do know it's an invasive plant. So once again, it's gorgeous, right? but it's an invasive plant. We have more feather grass. And I do have to say in the early 2000s, you guys, I had feather grass and I, 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 I throw it away all the time. I have tons of little <laughs> sprouts that I'm like, you're invasive, get off my land. So this totally makes sense. Mustard, more pampas grass. Mm -hmm. And that's a perfect segue because um, not only was it our, uh, our advertisement for this talk, but pampas grass is, one of the better known, more notorious um, invasive plants. So I have chosen that for my um, example invasive today. And yeah, I see a lot of um, really great or really terrible, I guess, examples of invasive plants in the chat. And um, many of them, you know, some of them are on our list. Um, some of them aren't. And hopefully that'll become clear why we choose certain plants to put on our list and not others. Um, but yes, so for an example, um, this is a picture of pampas grass. Um, and this is actually being uh, grown at a wholesale nursery in this picture. So um, yes, that's normally where the problem gets started. And let's see. trying to advance my slide, but oh, no, it's freezing. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> There's a little delay. Um, here is a picture of pampas grass a little further down the supply chain. This is at a retail nursery. And then here it is in its mature form in all of its um, invasive glory <laughs> in someone's front yard. And you can just see these big feathery plumes that are part of what makes the plant so attractive to people. Um, I've seen the new, newest trends on like Pinterest and for weddings and stuff is to use these plumes as decor. Um, people are still planting it in their yards. But the problem is those um, big, beautiful feathery plumes are full of thousands of seeds. And those seeds can spread very easily on the wind and they can end up um, not only in your neighbor's yard, but oftentimes they can end up in the wild areas outside of a neighborhood. You can see in that bottom right picture, there's a neighborhood and then behind the neighborhood, there's a bunch of uh, pampas grass that has established itself, probably from being started in someone's um, yard and their home landscaping. Um, but pretty soon, you know, you can have a full-blown invasion, um, such as we can see on this hillside where pampas grass has completely taken over. Um, it's crowded out the native vegetation. Um, it's pushed out plants that were good for um, habitat and shelter and food for wildlife and it's completely taken over um, and pampas grass is a very poor replacement for um, those plants the native wildlife because they're not very good for shelter or for food for wildlife so um, and this plant is enormous so it's 
huge. Um, it crowds everything out and it's really hard and really expensive to get rid of. Um, so you can see it's just filling up that space, very dense stand. So, you know, in pampas grass, as well as many of the other invasive plants, um, we had some great examples in the chat. Um, they cause numerous kinds of harm to the environment and the economy. Here are just some of the primary types of damage that we see and kind of track and monitor um, in the state. And this really just gets to be a very um, expensive problem, to be honest. And I don't know if anyone wants to um, wager a guess or an estimate in the chat at all about how much California spends annually um, on this problem. If you've gone through the plant right training before, you might already know the number that we used, but um, yeah, it's a very expensive problem. And if you wanna wager a guess here, you, you can before I reveal the answer. All right, so how much does California spend annually on mitigating invasive plants? Any any guesses? Drop it in the chat. I, I do have to say that the pampas grass is beautiful and I have seen it on Instagram and Pinterest and truly I'm like, it's so pretty, but honestly, so bad. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a it's a beautiful decor plant, but um, we do we do have someone that said in the comments that they sprayed their uh, use of it in decor with hairspray so the seeds wouldn't fly around. And yeah, I mean, there's stuff you can do, but we we just need to get it out of California as we saw that it's, uh, you know, hanging out on hillsides, taking over full river bottoms and creeks and creek beds. All right, Alex, we do have some people guessing 10 million. We have two people with 10 million. So would you like to enlighten us if it is $10 million per year? Yeah, um, I, unfortunately, it's a lot higher. So um, it's over $80 million a year um, is the figure that we normally give. And so, yeah, as you can see, this is a very um, expensive problem. And at Plant Right, we like to believe that it's a preventable problem, at least, um, you know, from the retail perspectives, we believe we can, you know, stop some of those sales. And so that's why, um, that's part of why Plant Right is focused on the sale of ornamental plants, which are also invasive plants. Um, you, now know that this is a very expensive problem, but um, did you know that horticulture is actually one of the main pathways or the main pathway um, for the entrance of invasive plants? And you know, some of it has been just through um, contaminated seed or packing materials. There's lots of different ways that invasive plants can be introduced, um, but some of them were intentionally planted such as such as um, our notorious uh, friend, uh, Pampas grass, which was introduced over a hundred years ago um, before people really knew that it was an invasive plant and knew about all the damage it could cause. And yet we know about this issue and it is still very much for sale today. Um, that's where Plant Right comes in. We um, are focused on horticultural invasive plants. Um, so that is our main focus, because as you can see, that is a major pathway for invasive plants into the state. So um, I do wanna dive more into what Plant Right is doing about them, um, but as we're kind of about to change topics, I just wanna ask, you know, are there any kind of general questions about Plant Right? Um, any questions about the definition of invasive plants before we move on? I don't see anything in the chat just yet, but let's give people a, a minute to post up in there. Um, Alex, how long have you been working with Plant Right? I started in October 2019, so um, just over a year now. So 
I was like my big thing last year was planning for the 2020 survey. Um, and then of course, uh, <laughs> um, COVID hit. And so we had to cancel and kind of redirect our plans, but, um, um, if, if you could say one thing that surprises people about you working for a plant, right. Or like what, when you tell them about your job, what would it be? Like when you say I work for plant, right. And we are invasive plants. Do people look at you funny? You know, a lot of times if it's not like a, a science crowd or a gardening crowd, people ask me what are invasive plants. So you're like always educating. I love it. That's how master gardeners are too. When we're together, we're, we're all plant nerds. We get it. And then you get around other people. You're like, this is our opportunity. <laughs> yep. All right. <laughs> it doesn't look like we have any questions. So if you want to go ahead and continue, please do so. Okay, great. All right. So what is Plant Right doing about invasive plants? And um, as we kind of asked in the beginning um, about the Plant Right nursery survey. Um, you know, some of you have participated before, and for those of you who haven't, um, I will give some background. But um, the spring nursery survey um, is kind of one of our main um, pillars of our program, and we use it in order to um, track the sales of invasive plants in the retail nursery market. And we use that data to inform our overall strategy and make updates to our plant list um, so that our recommendations are relevant and still have impact um, because that is one of our main goals. We want to make sure that we're having an impact with the information that we put out there. Um, and I do want to give a little shout out here because um, the UC Master Gardeners have been one of our main volunteer bases for all of our past surveys. And um, to do a survey like ours, you really do need a volunteer group um, like yourselves on our side. And um, I just want to pause here and just give a shout out again, just a thank you to anyone who has participated in the survey in the past. Um, you really are, you know, the reason why the survey has been so successful um, in past years and just really grateful for that. And um, here are some of the results and that you can see from our survey. So in a typical survey year, um, we'll survey around 300 stores and we have um, 150 or more volunteers from throughout the state. In 2017, we were able to survey over 45 counties. Um, and as has been mentioned, um, we unfortunately could not do our 2020 survey. Um, I know a lot of you went all the way through the training process. Um, a couple people even submitted surveys before we had to shut everything down uh, for COVID last year. And um, I do wanna mention that um, this year we are planning to do the survey um, with some safety precautions in place. Um, however, you know that you wanna check with your organization, um, you wanna check with your county and make sure that you're following all the proper safety protocols. Um, see if your organization is allowing this kind of participation this year. Um, we want everyone to be safe and um, to make sure that they're following all the guidelines and not doing anything that they feel uncomfortable doing. So um, stay tuned about the survey. Um, if you want, you can go on our website and sign up for Plant Right newsletters, and we will be making um, announcements about the survey and so forth um, on that platform. And that way you can just keep in touch, and I'm sure the Master Gardeners will be keeping you in the loop as well um, as we move forward. Alex, would you like to take a question real quick? Oh, sure. So we have something from Kimberly Young and she is in the floral industry and she is asking, has Plant Right discussed this industry and thought they could have an impact there? Thank you, Kim, for your question. 
Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. Um, that's a great question. And it is something that has come up, um, but it is not something we've ventured into yet. Um, so I, I am curious about whether, um, I am curious to see if that's a direction that plant right will go in the future. Um, that would be a discussion to be had with uh, the steering committee. And it would be a little bit of a change of industry for us. Um, although the floriculture industry is very much related to the nursery industry. Um, so far, we've been very specific about surveying the retail nursery industry. Um, and not even venturing, we haven't done seeds or wholesale or anything like that yet, but potentially in the future. So we'll see. That's great. We do have some questions that I think could be answered in your next slide. So I'm gonna hold off and see if, uh, see if this will cover some of the people's questions. Thanks, Alex. Okay, yeah, great. Um, all right, so the next thing I wanna show you is kind of what we do with this data. Um, and that would be creating uh, this plant list. Now, it, I know the writing's too small, so you probably can't read it all from this screen. Oh, going backwards. Um, but we do have links to these pages on our website, and I believe that just um, was dropped in the chat. Um, so we have a profile on our website for each of our invasive plants and then we have a suite of suggested non-invasive alternative plants for every invasive plant that we have listed and then you might be able to see that there's a little picture of california color-coded california in the upper right hand corner and that is um, our climate zone map so we have the state broken down into about five climate zones. Um, so we're asking you to also keep that in mind because we may suggest a certain plant alternative for um, the mountains that we wouldn't suggest for the coast um, or for Central Valley and not for the desert and so on. Um, so you see that there is a kind of more specific and kind of nitty gritty details you could get into. And if you go to our um, website, you can look at those in a little bit more detail and find something um, that is suitable for your region. And so we have these suggested alternatives and our plant list committee is the one who has come up with these uh, alternatives and they've based it on several things. Um, they try to find plants that are good substitutes based on their size and the way that they look and how available they are, um, as well as kind of their functionality. So that is another thing we have kept in mind. Um, so the non-invasive plants have a lot of similar qualities to the invasive plants, but without the invasive qualities um, that we are so wary of. Um, but once again, keep that um, kind of example in mind of it might not fit every region. Um, I do have a couple of examples for invasive plant versus non-invasive plant. Um, so maybe I can go on to show a couple of those. So on the left, um, we have one of our invasive plants highway ice plants, um, totally destructive on the coast, destroying coastal dune habitats, definitely not recommended. Um, and then on the right-hand side of the screen, we have trailing ice plant, which if you look at its scientific name, Delosperma cooperi, it's actually a completely different species from the highway ice plant. Um, and it does not share the same invasive qualities as highway ice plant, yet they both function as kind of this succulent looking ground cover. Um, so 
If you're looking for an ice plant that might function as a ground cover, we recommend the one on the right trailing ice plant and not the invasive one on the left, which is highway ice plant. Um, for another example, um, we, this has been brought up in the comments um, already, but we have Mexican feather grass on the left, which is the invasive plant. Um, it's got all these kind of little wispy, um, flowery seed, seed heads up here. Those and seed then, heads attack all my pets. Like they are the major carriers <laughs> of that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and I see, I see this one planted everywhere, like in my neighborhood. When I go to the department store by my house, it's planted in their parking lot and their landscape. But I also right. see it like in sidewalk cracks and in like abandoned lots and stuff. So it's it's everywhere. A survivor. <laughs> <laughs> it's a survivor. <laughs> um, one of our suggested alternatives for Mexican feather grass is the blue grandma grass on um, the right hand side here. It's got those pretty little like eyelash um, like uh, seed heads and it's not invasive. Um, yet it still kind of gives that same sort of whimsical, um, flowy look as the Mexican feather grass, but without all of the harmful, um, invasive effects of the Mexican feather grass. So those are some of the examples I have. Um, if you want more kind of examples, um, I do recommend that non-invasive page on our website. Um, Calscape is also a great resource if you're looking for California native plants specifically. So yeah. <laughs> um, were there any questions before I kind of jump into the next slide? Well, I, th I think even your next slide is uh, kind of an answer about who you're, uh, like where we're going. Cause there's some people asking about Lowe's and Home Depot and that they're still selling stuff and oh, doing perfect. this and doing that. And uh, I do want to remind people like, this is going to be a work in progress. There's always going to be some invasive plant that plant rights going to target. So this is what we're doing. This is great. This is the work that they're actually on the ground, slowly educating and getting people in line. So this is great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the ways that we enforce um, the plant list is to partner with retail nurseries. And um, so here are some of them on the screens. And I know, you know, a lot of people do bring up Lowe's and Home Depot and say, well, they still have some invasive plants. And I want to make, um, I just want to be kind of clear on what our retail partnership requirements are, they agree not to sell the invasive plants on our priority list, which um, at the moment is only seven plants, which maybe doesn't seem like a lot, but um, it's been narrowed down through a process of looking at our survey data, looking at what's still commonly sold in the nursery industry, what's having the biggest impact, um, in the state. So um, there are a lot of factors that go into the decision. And we also want our plant list to be actionable. So things that we think we could actually get out of circulation events, um, out of circulation eventually. So we do focus on plants that um, we hope will actually be completely out of the nursery industry one day. So it is, oh, go ahead. Um, Alex, we have we have a comment from another Alex um, that just happens to be uh, a Lowe's garden employee. So thank you for coming. We love that you're here. But um, they said they can only speak for their store, but we do sell invasive plants and are currently working to stop selling them. So great partnerships working towards eradicating these things from just being sold to the public. Um, I know that as a uh, person who has an invasive plant or planted an invasive plant, I continually remove it. I try and dispose of it um, in the way prescribed. And Alex, that's that's the next question I would like to ask. It was asked a little earlier. I don't think you've hit it yet. But like, let's say I do have that Mexican feather grass. How do I dispose of it now? 
Yeah, um, that's a great, I, I mean, that's a great question. So um, if you're able to remove it, I mean, I mean, to the extent that it's, you know, feasible from your yard, I highly recommend that. Um, be sure if you do that, not to compost it. That is landfill uh, material, in my opinion, because um, you don't want those seeds going to your home compost or to a yard waste where it can, you know, be spread by the, the yard waste truck all the way to the dump and then added to a seed bank at the, you know, compost pile there. Um, so I would say, yeah, try to remove it if you have it. Another strategy if um, full out removing the invasive plant is not feasible for you, um, being sure to kind of prune, um, especially with grasses, pruning back the seed heads before they've actually actually set seed, um, trying to prune them back before that point and throwing those away, putting them in a nice tight sealed bag and throwing those away into the landfill. Um, that also helps control the spread. Um, those are, yeah, just some of the ways I can think of it. And it kind of depends on the plant. Um, but that's uh, one way you can manage it. Now, I do know that for my Mexican feather grass, I started bagging it and throwing it in my trash trash so it didn't end up in my local composting um, garbage because, yeah, they give us three free yards a year of compost. I don't want it back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, and some compost piles might get hot enough that they'll kill seed, but there's no guarantee <laughs> so <laughs> they might not as well yeah alex one more one more question i'm not sure if you can answer this one but i'm going to ask it it's from priscilla she she said that she heard that french broom sold at retail nurseries are sterile is it true so <laughs> brooms are a a tricky one um french broom specifically i don't believe is sterile but um there are i think certain brooms that are sold as sterile however if um there is some speculation or um i don't necessarily have like the scientific evidence in front of me but there is some speculation that even the supposedly sterile types might be able to cross with some of the other brooms. So if they're near another broom that isn't sterile or they're planted by one, um, there could be some trouble with that still. So um, they will find a way. That's what I just heard. <laughs> they may find a way. <laughs> yeah. And, and brooms are pretty nasty. I mean, they're a beautiful plant, but they're a pretty nasty one when they get loose. So um I would recommend staying away from it if you can plant something like forsythia or, or something instead. Which I love. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you'd like to continue, I don't see any other questions that I'm going to pop up. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, just a couple other things I wanted to mention. Um, so besides our retail um, nursery partnership program, we also have a free continuing education um, course online. It's good for about one hour of credits and um, there are certain programs. You'll have to check with your individual programs to see if your organization gives credit for it. But I know um, CCN pros um, often get credit for it. I think there's like the G three landscaping and gardening group that also gives credit for um, our course and it's completely free. Um, it's about invasive plants. Um, actually, I think in this brochure, I think that is broom in the background. Yeah. Um, so that's an example of what can happen with broom when it gets loose. Um, but uh, it is geared more toward, this continuing education program is geared more towards landscape and nursery professionals. However, anyone who's interested in it can take the course and it'll probably just be a more, it's just a more in-depth version of some of what you're hearing today. Um, there's just more reading materials. There's a, 
a little video that goes along with it. So um, if you're interested, you can check that out on our website. It's totally free. And um, beyond that, just uh, the other ways to get in touch with us, social media, we're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of that. So, um, and then of course there's our, our newsletter that goes out about quarterly. So if you wanna keep in touch with us there too, um, you certainly can. Awesome. We we dropped it in the chat too, how to stay in contact with you. Um, Alex, that brings us to the end of your presentation. Uh, we have about 96 people online with us still. So um, awesome. it's, open, it's open for questions right now. Um, Alex, in general, um, when you guys, when, when PlantRight takes that survey data back, um, what, I know you said what you guys do with it to prioritize, but how often do you guys reprioritize? Is it a yearly thing? Is it every few years? Like, what's that process? So, um, I've been here a few years yeah. and I've seen plants fall off and I'm like, were we successful? What's happening? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. So, um, I will admit there's been a little gap um, since we've last uh, reevaluated the list. So we were going to relaunch the survey last year, but um, before that, our most recent survey was 2017. And that has to do with just some programmatic restructuring that we did. And um, the program actually moved from one organization to another. Um, so there was, a few years where things were just kind of complicated and we didn't do the survey. But um, previously, um, I think it's from 2010 to 2017, we were doing an annual survey and basically reevaluating the plant list every year. Um, and the criteria that the plant list committee came up with is that if a certain plant was found at less than 1% of the retail nurseries um, for three consecutive years, then it was considered retired from the list. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, I think I want to say in 2010, we had about um, 19 plants on the list. And then we're all the way down to seven plants. And that's with some new additions to the list as well. So um, it is an evolving thing. It's a it's a changing thing, and um, we want to try and get it up to date. And it's been a little. It might be a little out of date, but hopefully we'll we'll get some more data this year to kind of inform um, where we're at on all these different plants. Well, we appreciate the work that you're doing and trying to move things forward um, with all of our lives. We've had to shift for COVID and, and other things and working safely. And we appreciate that, uh, that you guys are continuing this, this effort. Um, we do yes. have a question from Yvonne Sabio, and she wants to know about milkweed. So um, here's your question. Any plan to promote native milkweed instead of the orange ornamental ones sold at Home Depot, per, um, et cetera, per the California Native Plant Society recommendations? So I will say that um, we love the California Native Plant Society. We very much support their work. They're one of our allies and we work with them. Um, however, Plant Right is not um, specifically promoting native plants. Um, there are many native plants that we include on our safer alternatives list, um, but native plants aren't our focus per se. So Unless it's been um, evaluated, well, I I know that the the conversation around milkweed is a very important one. However, it's not um, a plant or a topic that we're uh, focused on. Great. Whoops. Let's see. Oh, we. <laughs> Alex, from Alex to Alex, um, what are your thoughts on bougainvillea? Oh, uh, you know, I would have to do a deeper dive into that one. Um, Plant Right has not officially made any stance on that in either direction. So I don't have an official Plant Right stance for it, but um, you can always check out Calflora to see, you know, if it's on their um, weed mapper at all, you could check out 
California Invasive Plant Council to see what their stance is on it. I don't know if they have one or not, um, but I don't have a stance on it from Plant Right. If you email me, I could try and get you some more information though. Perfect. Um, let me put back up your email. Boop. Oh, let me do a double so I can be on screen too. I don't want you to be lonely. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, for, for people who are um, not part of the UC Master Gardener program or not really familiar with what we do, we also, as a Master Gardener program, believe in something called um, Right Plant, Right Place. And uh, Marcy Souza in the comments said that the Master Gardeners has um, a, a events that have plant this, not that. That's the kind of thing we love to see on a statewide level is alternatives. So Alex had brought up that not they did, that her organization doesn't necessarily push uh, non-natives. Um, so they are, 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 are native plants in particular, but offer some suggestions. So um, if you are looking for native plants in your area or looking for something like that, contacting your local UC Master Gardener program would be um, my top choice. Or looking like Alex said at other places like Calflora, um, Calscape. Calscape. Uh, I'm saying lots of things, and I'm hoping that that my that my uh, partners in the background, who are my magic minions, typing stuff in the chat for me, are dropping things eventually. So I apologize. I should have came more prepared. You guys who are typing for me. Um, but you can find the UC Master Gardener program online. We're all over the, the um, all over California. We, although are um, restricted uh, because of COVID, we are still offering some online services depending on what county you're in. Uh, but there's lots of information online as far as native plants go, which we're all happy about to promote and do. And some people are 100% native plants. Some aren't. I know that um, I am a total. Lowe's and Home Depot shopper. So if it's there, I tend to look at stuff. And I know that I have coworkers who are really into uh, native plants. So we all have our own thing. But uh, definitely what, uh, what we can all agree on is after listening to Alex, well, I think we can all agree on it, uh, is that uh, not planting invasive plants in the beginning seems like the right way to go. And then if we do have them trying to remove them or remove seed heads or control what we already have. Uh, I, I have seen, like I said before, some stuff fall off the list. So I'm very proud of your guys' work of helping get some of those things off. And um, I have take, I took the plant right training this year in 2020 to do it. And then it got canceled. And I saw some people earlier in the talk talking about how they, as volunteers, took the training and didn't get to participate. But um, Alex had mentioned earlier that uh, that we're not sure about the survey for coming up, but it's going to be you know dependent on people's counties of participation. I know that I'm in a purple tier county right now, so my participation participation in things is very limited at this point. But I do look forward to learning about uh, invasive plants and how I can help in the future. And then you know if my neighbor puts one in, you know I'm going to talk to them about it. Nice, everybody. Just nicely. <laughs> um, all right. We don't have any other questions coming in, but we do have some thank yous. So who do we have here? Joni. Oh, I think she used an emoji. I'm not even sure what it is. Uh, but Joni uh, said thank you both and put a little like plant emoji. So I feel very, um, very <laughs> cute about that one. Let me show it. Ah, cute plant emoji. Um, and then we have Alex to um, both of us, I guess, um, saying just great and thanks. Uh, we have a few other um, other thank yous, and we just want to appreciate everyone for being here today. We do have more lives that I plan to schedule for the rest of the year coming up. I just want to say that it's been great people coming here and joining us live and seeing people enjoy these types of talks. We have been having them at noon and around 10. So depending on when you can join us live or not, we're hoping that we see more people online. Feel free to share this type of thing. Feel free to talk about Plant Right over the phone or any Zoom meeting you're in. We appreciate you uh, talking to people about invasive plants and knowing more about invasive plants. And with that, if you go to plantright.org, you can see that list of things to plant instead if you have something um, 
naughty in your yard like you like I do and you're trying to plant something different. So Alex, we really do appreciate you so much. We do have more thank yous coming in. I'm not sure if you're seeing them, but we I just am. Yeah. yeah. And well, look, we, we have <laughs> look, like people close like Oakland. It's like, hi That's neighbors. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and, and just thanks everyone for having me today. Um, I do want to mention while my contact information is up on the screen, if you call and leave me a message, um, I will eventually get it, but I probably only check voicemails about once a week or once every two weeks. So if you want a speedy response, that info at plantright.org email is really the best way to reach me since I'm I'm working from home these days, most days. So great information. Um, I know that uh, it takes me a while for voicemail as well. All right, Alex, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Everyone, thank you so much. If you didn't catch what you wanted, this is on the UC Master Gardener YouTube channel. It's going to live there. So don't worry. You can watch it. You can fall asleep to it at night and listen to it. You can uh, commit it to your memory and uh, talk to everyone about it um, over the phone <laughs> and educate everybody else. Alex, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and end our live broadcast. Thank you, everyone.